At 8.30 in the morning of February 16, 1945, the sky behind me was filled with paratroopers of the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment, beginning the most unique and daring airborne operation of World War II. After the fall of Manila and the infamous Bataan Death March, Corregidor fell to the Japanese on May 6, 1942. After a four-month siege, the remnants of the American garrison were made prisoner. The Japanese hold on Corregidor would last for almost three years. On December 15, 1944, the Allies landed on the island of Mindoro and established airfields to provide air support for retaking of the northern Philippines. The airfields at San Jose were only one hour flight time to Luzon and proved critical to the successful liberation of Luzon, Manila, and Corregidor. The task of recapturing the rock as Corregidor was known went to the 503rd Parachute Regimental Combat Team of Lieutenant Colonel George M. Jones and elements of Major General Roscoe B. Woodward's 24th Infantry Division. Jump veterans of the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment are briefed on the landing at Corregidor. Despite the small area of the island, two separate landing zones are selected. The jump will follow days of air and sea bombardment of the island. On the day of the jump, February 16, 1945, paratroopers of the 503rd checked their equipment and board the aircraft. Off for the mission is at 0715. The target run is an hour away. Corregidor is sighted without encountering aerial interception and the signal is given to prepare for leaving the plane. Two flights of C-47s head due north toward the island as they approach their targets on the first run. The planes arrive at 0830. The naval and air bombardment that began at dawn is continuing. A flight of A-20 sweeps in ahead of the transports to strafe ground installations and enemy personnel. targets, only eight men at a time are dropped on each of the three runs. The troops aim for the golf course and the parade grounds on the rocky plateau known as Topside. The landing fields are next to the sites of our barracks and headquarters buildings destroyed during the siege in 1942. Troopers are dropped short of their targets and go over the cliffs. They climb down to the beaches where they're picked up by PT boats. Infantry enters battle in a cohesive unit and combat soon scatters them, but not so the paratroopers. They enter the battle area scattered and then slowly gather into squads and platoons and companies and finally battalions. One of the first paratroopers on the ground was Lieutenant William Calhoun, platoon leader of F Company's 1st Platoon. He documented his time on Kriegador in amazing detail and devoted his later years to researching and writing about the 503rd. Bill passed in 2014. 
In cooperation with Paul Whitman, they produced several books and shared his experiences on Paul's comprehensive website, Corregidor.org. Paul Whitman is an honorary member of the 503rd PRCT of World War II and of the 503rd Infantry Regiment and has generously given me permission to use their material in this video. Company F's Rally Point was the last two-story house on Officer's Row. The Officer's Row was built in the 1920s for the island's field grade officers to live with their families. We are now entering building 28D, the rally point for Company F and where they will set up their command post. The area around the building, of course, was not grown up at that time and they set up positions in some of the existing bomb and shell craters to provide cover. Apparently the Japanese had been caught eating their breakfast when the first wave of paratroopers dropped over the islands. There were uh, mess kits, rice on the table, and paper scattered on the desk. The air and naval bombardment continues to soften the island for a landing from the sea. Two hours after the paratroop landing, troops of the 3rd Battalion, 34th Infantry, began moving in towards San Jose Beach. The beach is near bottom side, the wreck dock area on the flat eastern section of the island. Mortar, machine gun, and small arms fire meet the men as they hit the shore. The objective is to push across the 500 yard wide neck of the island and make contact with the paratroopers on topside. The beach is heavily mined and most of the first vehicles to land are damaged. A machine gun nest is hidden in a cave behind an old refrigerant plant, but a 50 caliber machine gun and a tank's 75 millimeter finally knock it out. By early afternoon, the 3rd Battalion moved forward to establish contact with the 503rd. There were many acts of gallantry and sacrifice by the men of the 503rd over the next few days. One that particularly stood out was Private Lloyd G. McCarter. Shortly after the initial parachute assault on 16 February 1945, he crossed 30 yards of open ground under intense enemy fire and at point-blank range silenced a machine gun with hand grenades. On the afternoon of 18 February, he dispatched six snipers. When a large force attempted to bypass his company, he voluntarily moved to an exposed area and opened fire. The enemy attacked his position repeatedly throughout the night and was each time repulsed. By 2 o'clock in the morning, all the men about him had been wounded, but shouting encouragement to his comrades and defiance at the enemy, he continued to bear the brunt of the attack fearlessly exposing himself to locate enemy soldiers and then pouring heavy fire on them. He repeatedly crawled back to the American lines to secure more ammunition. When his Thompson submachine gun would no longer operate, he seized an automatic rifle and continued to inflict heavy casualties. This weapon in turn became too hot to use and discarding it, he continued with an M1 rifle. At dawn, the enemy attacked with renewed intensity. Completely exposing himself to hostile fire, he stood erect to locate the most dangerous enemy positions. He was seriously wounded, but though he had already taken out more than 30 of the enemy, he refused to evacuate until he pointed out immediate objectives for attack. He was subsequently awarded the Medal of Honor. The wound he received that day had lodged a bullet so close to his heart that it could not be removed. He was discharged in 1945 and married and lived a quiet life until his wife died of cancer. In February 1956, despondent over his wife's death and in constant pain, he took his own life. The most ferocious battle to regain Corregidor occurred at Wheeler Point on the night of 18 February and early the next morning. We're here at Wheeler Point where the Banzai Point battle occurred. Late afternoon of the, of the 16th, which was a Sunday, uh, they met here for their orders at the bunker. The company's command center was here. I'm standing here at uh, the bunker where Company D were 
the command center was. So when the 4th platoon retreated back here to a more secure defensive position, they were here. And as you can see, they could go no further. So they literally had their backs to a cliff, 500 foot cliff drop down to the sea. And uh, they were given orders to uh, secure these areas. Down the road here was the second platoon. To, to my left, about 20 feet across here is a large crater in which the fourth platoon, a mortar company of 19 men. At 10.30, under a moonless night, 500 Japanese came out of the Battery Smith Armory and charged the American and the Philippine positions. Cleanup operations continued until February 26. Infantry and tank units of Company I, 503rd Paratroop Regiment, mop up on Corregidor. Sniper and machine gun pockets in the hills near Breakwater Point are destroyed by our troops moving against strong enemy resistance. Guns from American destroyers pour shells into the area to cover the paratroopers' advance. Machine gun fire reduces positions. Troops of Company F, 503rd Paratroop Regiment, close in on a fortified artillery magazine. An 81 millimeter mortar fires smoke shells on a strong point to identify the target for bombing. Low flying planes strafe the enemy. A blown up powder magazine destroyed to halt our advance. Companies A and B of the 1st Battalion on a patrol mission were trapped and wiped out in the explosion. A knocked out U.S. tank. Troops of the 3rd Battalion moving up to replace the 1st Battalion pass American ambulances wrecked in the explosion. Fire Direction Center of a Parachute Field Artillery Battalion controlling gunfire on the eastern part of Corregidor. A heavy artillery barrage prepares the way for the infantry advance. Patrols move along the beach at Rock Point, cleaning out enemy pockets in caves and cliffs. Japanese suicide boats found along the shoreline of Corregidor. Each boat had a one-man crew and carried a 300-pound charge of dynamite. Several of our ships were rammed and sunk by the boats. PT boats crossed Manila Bay to Corregidor, bringing General Douglas MacArthur to the island for flag-raising ceremonies. General MacArthur is met at the dock by Colonel George M. Jones, commanding officer of the 503rd Regiment. The general enters the west end of Malinta Tunnel. General MacArthur arrives at the site of the flag-raising ceremony near the ruins of the officers' quarters. During the ceremony, General MacArthur cited the 503rd Regimental Combat Team for brilliant action on Corregidor and presented Colonel Jones with a distinguished service cross. I see that the old flag staff still stands. Have your troops hoist the colors to its peak and let no enemy ever haul them down.